All right, Applat, here we go. So uh, you're listening to this in class, and I'm up in the front of the room. I'm talking to the um, the tap kids, um, and this this will probably get a little bit long. So just every five minutes, hit the pause button, stop, stretch, whatever, keep your attention. But uh, my goal today is basically just to give you a rundown of the Aeneid. So give you a rundown basically of what you're going to read. Um, you're going to love it. Uh, this book is amazing. It's I, I arguably the best work of, of all of, of literature, definitely the best work of Latin literature. Um, I probably shouldn't say that given that I have a book about the Thebaid and I like it a lot. But I mean, the, the Aeneid started it off for Latin literature. It's just amazing. Um, keep in mind that you're going to have a background reading quiz over book one on Friday. You can look up on the board and see I've written it there. Uh, and so definitely read book one of David West's translation Take some notes, uh, look online for notes, summaries, all that kind of thing, and get get right with book one and, and then ace that quiz. It'll be an open note quiz too, so just take as many notes as you want uh, and get ready to, to, to start off uh, your, your grade with a really good really good uh, quiz grade. So right now, I'm, like I said, I'm going um, I'm going to give you a rundown of the Aeneid just to kind of tell you what's going on with it and uh, give you an expectation for what you're going to read this year. <clears throat> so in AP, we're going to read the Aeneid first in first semester, and then Ver, uh, Caesar's De Bello Gallico second semester. But we'll talk about the Caesar second semester. All right, so let's get started here. Um, we have um, Virgil's Aeneid, and uh, Virgil wrote, let me go back to the beginning here. So Virgil wrote the Aeneid uh, in the reign of Augustus. So he started writing the Aeneid in 29 B.C., and he ended it, or well, he died in 19, B, uh, 19 BC. So he didn't finish it. And Augustus, he actually wanted it to be burned uh, if it wasn't finished by the time of his death. But Augustus, you know, saw it and, and knew what Virgil was writing because he paid him to write it. And he was like, no, 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 no way. And so he, uh, he basically tore up that part of Virgil's will and had a group of scholars finish it and then published it. And then pretty soon every it was in the hands of every school child uh, all throughout uh, the Roman world, or at least through the city of Rome, because the main point of it was to glorify Augustus, was to show the Roman people, hey, that's this Augustus guy, yeah, um, he, he has been fated to rule Rome since the dawn of Rome. It, it's always been in the cards. And Augustus is going to lead a rebirth of Rome. And, uh, and it's all good. It's all, all in the stars, all in the plans of the gods all along. So just trust Augustus and it'll all be good. All right, so here we go. Some of this you know, uh, and I really, really hope that you guys on your own time watch the movie Troy. Now, look, it's R-rated, so I'm not really supposed to tell you to watch it, but it, just watch it. It's good. Um, ladies, you get a good shot of Brad Pitt's butt. Uh, you know, he's in there. He plays Achilles. Um, it's it's not the most well-acted movie. It's not the most well-directed movie, but it's a good movie. It's a, it's a guilty pleasure. It's good stuff. Okay, so let's talk about the background here. We got uh, the Trojans and the Greeks. Okay, so King Priam is the king of Troy. Now he's got a whole bunch of sons and daughters, but we're going to focus on two of them. Uh, we got Hector and Paris. Hector in the movie is played by Eric Bana. Um, some pretty good casting, I guess. Er Hector is supposed to be the quintessential warrior. He is the, you know, the the best leader. You know, the best Trojan, the best swordsman, the best fighter, everything. Then you got Paris, and Paris is played by Orlando Bloom. Brilliant casting because he always looks like he's about to cry. Um, Paris is a ladies' man. He's a lover, not a fighter. And in fact, his weapon is bow and arrow, which which in the classical world was sort of a coward's weapon because you didn't have to face your enemy. You could just sort of pick him off from, from up high. Um, I think you guys know the story, basically that Paris uh, steals uh, a, a Greek uh, a princess named, um, named Helen um, and you know, takes her back to, to Troy, and then the Greeks don't like that, so they go and they, they attack Troy. Um, and that's basically what happens here. So let's talk about uh, the Greeks. So we've got two brothers, uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus, or we'll, we'll just say Menelaus. Menelaus is sort of a weird pronunciation sometimes, but Menelaus, okay? Um, Agamemnon is the king of a Greek city called Mycenae. Menelaus is the king of a Greek city called Sparta. And so Menelaus, this guy, is the one that marries, um, marries Helen. Um, and, uh, you know, he... Uh, Helen is played by Diane Kruger in the movie, and she is absolutely stunning. And so they good casting all around, I think. Then you got Brad Pitt. All right, here we go. Brad. 
Brad Pitt plays Achilles. Achilles didn't nearly have the pouty lips that Brad Pitt has, but certainly look at those muscles, right? Can't deny it. All right, here we go. Achilles is the leader of a group of people called the Myrmidons. Uh, Myrmidons in Greek, actually in Greek means ants in English. And uh, that doesn't sound very scary, but the Greeks kind of thought, you know, the ants were militaristic and they marched in line and they did everything in concert and they were very precise and very, you know, um, very dutiful. And so that makes sense. But Achilles is the wild card. Achilles doesn't want to bend the knee to anybody. So when Agamemnon is trying to unite all of the Greek city-states, uh, Achilles says, hey, I'm, you're not my king. I'm my own, I'm my own man, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we got a couple of the Greeks. We got a guy named Odysseus, crafty Odysseus, and he's the one that the Odyssey is about. And he is from a town called, or a city called Ithaca. Um, uh, he is. There's another guy named Ulysses, but in later literature, the two names actually get not confused, but sort of conflated, right? Uh, kind of melded together, and so you get like James Joyce's Ulysses is actually about Odysseus. So there you go. So we got the two brothers there, the Atreidae or the Atreides, the, the sons of Atreus, and then you got Achilles, the main player here for the Greeks. All right, so here we go. So Agamemnon decides that he wants to unite all the Greek city-states and become the greatest power the world has ever seen. Uh, they also want to defeat Troy just because Troy is a power and, and they want to become more powerful. But in this, um, in this banquet between the Trojans and the Greeks, Paris and Helen strike up a, a, an illicit affair, and he either steals her or she comes willingly, but whatever. Uh, Menelaus doesn't have her when they leave. She, she's, she's held back at Troy, um, and so Menelaus wants her back. So the Greeks uh, siege Troy, and it's a long siege. It's 10 years long, and that is the whole entire subject of the Iliad. Uh, and I'm about to contradict myself because the Iliad actually isn't even really about the Sack of Troy. The Sack of Troy is just kind of a backdrop for the story of this guy, the story of Brad Pitt. Um, and if you look at the, the first line of Homer's Iliad, Men en aed a teia peleade o Achilleos. Saying, O oh goddess, the wrath of Peleus' son Achilles. Um, it, that's what it's about. Uh, and, um, and, and kind of the power struggle between Achilles and, and Agamemnon. Um, but nonetheless, they sack Troy, 10 year siege. And uh, back to the Aeneid in book two, that's the story of the fall of Troy. So let me back up for a second. In book one of the Aeneid, we see. It opens up in Medias race, like all good ethics, right? In the middle of things. Um, that's what happened in the Iliad. That's what happens in the Odyssey. This is what happens in the Thebaid. Uh, this is what happens in all classical ethics. And um, so at the, at the opening of, of the first time we see Aeneas is about 90, 91 lines in. And he is in the throes of death. He's on a ship in the middle of a storm, he's about to be drowned, he's lamenting his fate, he's whining, um, his, his men are dying around him, and uh, they're, they're, it's doom and gloom. Well, the storm ends, they get shipwrecked on Carthage, which is a city in Africa, it's northern Africa, it's actually the city of Tunis, or Tun in Tunisia in Africa today. And um, they get shipwrecked there, and he and his men are brought to Dido, the queen of Carthage. And Dido immediately tells them, look, you're fine. We're going to help you. If you want to stay, stay. If you want to go, go. That's fine. But, but we're going you know, to we're we're be friends here for a second. And you're, we're going to have a banquet. And you're the guest. So his, his job, his responsibility as a guest is to entertain him, to tell a story. So book one ends with the banquet at, at Carthage. And Dido saying, hey, tell us your story. And so Aeneas takes a big deep breath and he says, okay, well, I really don't want to, but if you're going to make me, okay, here we go. So Aeneid books two and book and books two and three is the story that he tells. Really long one. It lasts all night. At the end of book three, the sun comes up. Um, so book two is the, the, the story of the sack of Troy. And so according to Virgil's Aeneid, his version of events, um, you know, the, the, all the Greek ships leave. Or, or, or they thought they left, and there's this horse standing there on the shore, and they don't know what to do with it. They're arguing back and forth, this and that, this and that. Well, they capture a Greek named Sinon. I'm going to go a little out of order. They capture a Greek named Sinon, who has been left behind. Sinon tells them that, that he's been left behind on purpose, and they've abandoned him and he, because he wronged somebody. 
But Sinan's real job is to convince them to bring the horse into Troy. Well, they still don't really want to. They're still not really sure. Uh, but then there's this guy named Laocoon. He's a great character. He's a great statue um, uh, of, of Laocoon and his sons in the Vatican. Uh, my kids from my people that went to Italy saw it this past summer. But uh, Laocoon comes running down from the mountain and, he's, and he says, Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's a trap. It's a trick. You know, it's like Admiral Akbar from Star Wars. It's a trap. Um, but, you know, he's, he's screaming, he throws his spear at the darn thing, and it thuds. You can even hear the hollow insides and the armor shaking insides. All of these are really good indications that you should definitely not bring it in. Well, right when he does that, these two snakes come out of the sea, and they devour Laocoon and his two sons. So the Trojans immediately are like, all right, let's bring this thing in. So they bring it into the city. They party like it's 1999. Uh, they party like rock stars. They get drunk. They all pass out. And in the middle of the night, the Greeks come out of the, the horse, and the, the, the slaughter is on. So they kill everybody uh, you know, in their sleep, basically. Um, there is a small contingent of Trojans that, that come to arms, and there's a big battle. King Priam is killed by Achilles' son named Pyrrhus. Great scene. Um, and Aeneas is one of the people that, that is awoken, and uh, he leads the defenses of the city. And so... Um, Let's talk about Aeneas for just a second here as he's, you know, just imagine him fighting and, and, and killing Greeks, okay, while we talk. Um, Aeneas marries one of the daughters of Priam. So Creus is one of Priam's daughters, and Aeneas becomes a prince because of that. Um, but, you know, Creus is married up because Aeneas is actually the, the, uh, a half-god. He is the son of Venus and of a guy named Anchises. But Venus is a goddess, and so Aeneas is half a god. It's pretty awesome. They have a son named Ascanius, which at various points in the Aeneid, they call him Eulus. And I'm going to just leave it up to you. I'm going to just leave this right here and leave it up to you to figure out what historical figure in Rome we are alluding to by that name. So here we go. Remember, Aeneas is fighting Greeks. He's killing Greeks. So he, he's fighting. Creusus says, hey, we, we got to go. And Aeneas is like, all right, all right, all right. Okay, all right, that's fine. Let's go. So they're like, all right, Dad, Anchises. Let's go. And Caius, he says, no way. I was born here. I'm dying here. Well, they can't, they can't leave him behind. So they're like, okay, I guess we have to stay. And they're trying, they're trying, trying. And he, he won't go. And finally, Jupiter sends some thunderbolts outside. Three of them. Boom, boom, boom. And then he, he, um, he sends a flame to sort of dance at the top of Aeneas' son, Ascanius. Remember the Euless kid, Ascanius? Uh kind of sends a flame to dance on the top of Ascanius' head. It's almost like that Christian, the Christian Pentecost, right? When the apostles are hiding and uh, all of the flames dance above their heads and it's a sign from God. Same thing. So Anchises is like, all right, I'm out. So they flee, they run. There's this great scene where Anchises is on the back of Aeneas. Aeneas is holding the hand of his son. So he's carrying his history on his back. He's holding the hand of his future. And then we got Creusa, right? The, the third wheel, she's kind of running behind, um, and she literally runs behind because when they get to the end, end, when they get to the outside of the city, she is nowhere to be found. Well, sorry guys, she dies. Um, she, her ghost visits Aeneas as he goes back and tries to find her and says, hey, I'm dead, can't do anything for me now, you got to get the heck out of Dodge. So he gets his family, all the other refugees, and they take off in some boats and they just leave. He doesn't know where he's supposed to go, doesn't know why, uh, he just, they're leaving. So, Remember, that was all book two, right? This is his retelling of, of what happened. Book three is his retelling of, of their odyssey around the seas to try to get to a settlement, try to get to Italy. Knows, at this point, he knows he's supposed to go to Italy, but he doesn't know exactly where that is and what he's supposed to do there. Um, and book, book three is a, exactly or almost exactly like Homer's Odyssey, just a really short version of it, except that Virgil writes in all of these really these places that are really important to Roman history along with what Homer had written in his Odyssey. So, you know, you get things like the Harpies. You get things like um, the Cyclops, the Skill and the Charybdis. Uh, but you also get all of these other places where there were really famous Roman battles, um, famous Roman settlements, um, places that are sacred to Apollo, which is, a, which is Augustus's... Uh, deity. And so this history, this intermingling of mythology and history is really important because then, you know, it, it's kind of like, well, our mythology is our history. Our history is our mythology. 
And that sets the stage for Virgil's main point, which is that Augustus has always been fated to rise to power and lead Rome. Really, really smart stuff. Really great propaganda. So you can see, like, here's Actium. Um, they, have, they hold Trojan games. I'm doing air quotes because this is sort of a, an invention of, of Virgil or an invention of Augustus. Um, but they do it at the site of what will be Augustus's big victory against Mark Antony to seize control of Rome in, um, in 31 BC. Um, okay, so, you know, they go to Italy and Sicily. That's where the Cyclops are. Messina, which is the, the start of the Carthaginian War, basically, and he puts the skill in the Charybdis there. That's pretty cool. Um, and then eventually, you know, he talks about Carthage. All right, so remember at the, at the beginning of Book 1, Aeneas was about to die in a storm, but then he gets shipwrecked at Carthage, and Book 1 ends with him starting to tell the story of how they got there, okay? So books two and three was the Iliad and the Odyssey, the story of the Trojan War and his wandering. And now book four is all about his time at Carthage. So immediately Queen Dido is in love with Aeneas, and Queen Dido has a sister named Anna. Um, Dido and Aeneas fall madly in love, uh, or, well, at least Dido falls madly in love with Aeneas. We're not really sure about Aeneas, but, you know, we, I guess we assume. Um... They have a marriage, and I'm definitely doing these quotes, air quotes, like these are right here, because they, they go into a cave, there's nymphs, there's ululating, there's flames, uh, there's all sorts of consummation of marriage going on, but Dido, Virgil says, is the only one that calls it marriage. Aeneas is just breezy. He's just whatever. Um, ladies, I know you'll appreciate that. Uh, so they kind of get married, but they're together. Anyway, they're together. They, they're sharing the same bed. They're sharing the same place. Uh, and they're there, Aeneas and his refugees are there for a while. Um, they're there for half a year, eight months, nine months, ten months, something like that. Well, at some point, when it's clear that Aeneas is totally comfortable and doesn't want to leave, uh, the gods send Mercury down, Jupiter sends Mercury down, and says, hey man, you got to get out of here. You, you have a fate. you got to get to Italy. you got to go. Well, Aeneas says, okay. And, and he tries to steal out in the middle of the night. Well, Dido finds out. She gets really mad. She confronts him. She yells at him. She curses at him. She does the guilt trip thing. She slaps him around a little bit. Uh, but Aeneas isn't moving. He, he's got a duty. He's got his piety. He's got his, his, his fate. So he's out. But Dido gets really upset. And as Aeneas is leaving, Dido kills herself. And thus sows the mythological slash historical uh, uh, enmity or rivalry between Carthage and, and Rome, which will play out in the Punic Wars in Roman history. So book five is uh, the funeral games for Anchises. I know that sounds maybe a little strange, but remember, funeral games is one of those things that you have to put in an epic, and it sounds a little arbitrary, it sounds a little uh, um, unimportant, but all those funeral games and the people that play it are all metaphorical. So you learn things about the various Trojans. You learn things, more importantly, about Aeneas and his ability as a leader, um, his ability to be fair, his ability to solve conflict, his ability to delegate. And uh, this is really important because books one through six, I, I'm not going to say I, it's we, everybody. It's a really obvious point. But books one through six of the Aeneid, the first half of the Aeneid, is about the education of Aeneas. It's about him becoming the leader that he needs to be in order to lead his people. And so book five is really important because you're seeing Aeneas step up and really lead all of his people in various ways through those funeral games. So book six, the next one, is another epic convention. He goes to the underworld. He's got to visit the underworld. And this time his reason is he wants to go visit his dad and get what he's supposed to do. Because he only has a vague notion of what he's supposed to be doing with all of his refugees. And his dad is the one that can tell him, the ghost of his dad, can tell him, okay, this is your fate. Here, I'm going to lay it out for you. So they go to Kumai, which is in Italy. I've been there. It's really cool. You can even crawl through the little Cumian Sibyl cave. Uh, and they go to the priestess of Apollo, who is, the priestess is called Sibyl. Uh, this one is a girl named Deophobe. Uh, De, um, but anyway, we, you just call the priestess Sibyl. And the Sibyl takes him to the underworld. We're going to talk about the Golden Bow and Avernus and all that stuff later. It's good stuff, but he goes to the underworld. And we get the greatest hits of the underworld. We get the ferryman Charon. We get the three-headed dog Kerberos. 
Um, Virgil's underworld looks a little bit different than Homer's. It's divided into three regions. Um, you got hell, right, Tartarus, where the bad people go. You got heaven, Elysium, where the good people go. But then you also have a neutral region. It's kind of the, the, the first part that they go to is uh, it's for people that are neither really good nor bad. It's for people, uh, jilted lovers, so Dido. Um, it's for infants, right? They're neither good nor bad. They, they hadn't been on earth long enough to be good or bad. So they're just kind of there, and they're not suffering, but they're not really happy either. Um, sinners, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff going on here. you got the Judges, Minos, Radamanthus, you know, those guys. Um, and then you've got uh, the Heaven area where it's all milk and honey. You've got Trojans that fought and died bravely in battle, uh, and then he finds Anchises there, of course, right? And Anchises kind of tells him everything. And one of the things that he tells him, and this is really, really new for mythological thought, he shows Aeneas a line of souls. They're all lined up in a, in a, in a single file line, and they're all going to drink from a river, a river called the River Lethe. And it's the river is, is called the River of Forgetfulness. And when they drink from it, they forget their past lives. And when they're done drinking, they walk through a gate, and they get reborn. And they're going to be reborn as Romans. And so in this line of people, Anchises points them out one by one, and he says, look... Here is your future of Rome. This is what's going to happen. Here is Romulus. Here is uh, um, you know, Julius Caesar. Here is Marius. Here is Sulla. Here is Augustus. Here is Marcellus. And he, and he points out all of these people that are going to come after Aeneas in this race of people that is going to rule the world. So at this point in the Aeneid, right, we're literally right halfway because it's the end of book six. If you didn't quite get the whole Virgilian, you know, ode to Augustus, this sort of propaganda for Augustus, he's literally smacking you across the face now. I mean, you cannot deny that this thing uh, at this point is propaganda to show you that Augustus has always been fated to rule. Okay, so I've been talking for a while, but I'm not going to talk nearly as long about the second half they needed. First, we're not going to read it. And second of all, I think it's, it's, it's much easier to encapsulate it. He gets to Italy after leaving the underworld and knowing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And um, he has to battle for his right to stay there. Okay, So the biggest part of this is in, you know, write this stuff down, write these names down, because you just got to keep these names straight. So I, I'm going to try and make it as, as uh, easy as possible to, to remember this. All right, When he gets there, the long and the short of it is that he has to fight the Latins and the Rutilians. Well, there's only so many refugees, so he's got to find some allies. So he he finds allies in these Greek people that are from a city called Palantium, and they're King Evander and Evander's son Pallas. All right, so let's recap, right? When he gets there, he has to fight the Latins and the Rutilians, and he's going to ally, the Trojans are going to ally with the people of Palantium, and also uh, some Etruscans as well, okay? All right, so Latins and Rutilians versus Trojans and Palantium. Let's talk about why. He gets there, and as he gets there, you know, these people are living their lives. Well, um, King Latinus has promised to marry his daughter Lavinia to this guy Turnus, this Rutilian named Turnus. Well, when Aeneas gets there, uh, Latinus gets a vision that, nope, you're supposed to marry your daughter to Aeneas. So he says, hey, sorry, Turnus, but I'm going to marry her to Aeneas. And Turnus is like, what the heck, man? This, we've never met this guy before. Forget it. Well, his, his wife, Amata, feels that way too, right? Here's King Latinus and his queen, Amata. Don't you love that, right? Her name means the loved one. So here's the Latin king and his love, lovely bride, and then their daughter from Lavinium. So really stock names. Anyway, King Latinus says, sorry, Turnus, I'm going to marry Lavinia to Aeneas. And Queen Amata says, uh, no, you're not. And, king Turnus, and Prince Turnus says, um, no, you're not. And so there we go. So Amata gets up angry, uh, the Latins get angry, and so it's on, right? War, the Latins against the Trojans, and the Latins and the Rutilians against the Trojans. So Aeneas needs more people. He goes to Palantium, King of Ander, they ally. He goes to the Etruscans, who are there. They ally with the Trojans. Um, we got this other guy, Mezentius. Don't worry about him. He's, uh, for what we need, not really important. All right, so Latins and Rutilians versus the Trojans and Palantium and the Etruscans. Um, okay, the war rages on through books 8 and book not, books 9. Really great stuff here, but again, as an overview, not really important. Uh, but it's all sorts of the shield of Aeneas, and nice, there's all sorts of Augustan propaganda here. 
Um, okay, so books 10, 11, and 12, this is where we got to talk a little bit more. So remember, King Evander had a son named Pallas, right, from Palantium, the kid from Palantium. Well, Pallas, at some point, meets Turnus in battle, and Turnus kills him. Which, you know, fair fight, whatever. Uh, Aeneas isn't happy about it, but it's a fair fight. But Turnus also takes a war prize. He takes Pallas' sword belt and kind of takes it as a trophy and shows it off. And that really, really ticks off Aeneas. So eventually, you know, the, the groups fight some more. But eventually it just comes down to, okay, Aeneas and Turnus have to duke it out. They have to have a duel. Um, you guys that read the Iliad or know about the Iliad, it's the same thing with where it's all, it was always going to be Hector versus Achilles, you know, Brad Pitt, uh, Eric Bana versus Brad Pitt. But the, the reason that they ultimately duel is because Achilles won't fight. And Achilles has this boyfriend named Patroclus. And Patroclus says, look, okay, Achilles, if you're not going to fight, I'm going to. So he takes Achilles' armor, goes out and fights. Well, you know, Hector in the battle sees Achilles, who he thinks is Achilles. They fight. Hector kills him. And when they pull off the helmet... Hector sees, well, he hasn't actually killed Achilles. He has killed Patroclus. When they bring Patroclus' body back into the Greek camp, uh, Achilles, Brad Pitt, just goes nuts and immediately challenges Hector to a duel, and he kills Hector, and he drags his body around, around the walls. So this is the, the, this is the, the analog here. Um, Turnus and Aeneas have to fight because Pallas, Aeneas' buddy, has, has been killed by Turnus. And so... Um, at the end of book 12, they fight, and uh, it's, it's honestly, it's really anticlimactic. It, I mean, I think it's anticlimactic for a reason, but uh, the whole battle is lasts about maybe 60 lines of poetry, and I mean, probably took 60 seconds, uh, maybe, you know, a couple minutes to, to narrate. I mean, it's really anticlimactic, um, and the, the end of the, you know, Aeneas defeats him, and it's not very suspenseful. I mean, they, they parry a little bit, and then Aeneas sticks him. And Turnus is on the ground, and enigmatically, Aeneas is about to spare him. He's about to say, okay, get up, you know, I beat you. Turnus says, hey, you beat me, you can have Lavinia, and settle here, it's fine, it's all good. And Aeneas is about to kind of help him up, and then he sees Pallas' sword belt around Turnus, and he says, nope, and he stabs him, and he kills him, and the end of the Aeneid... Uh, the last line of the Aeneid, in English at least, is, and Turnus's spirit fled into the darkness below. End of book, end of scene, end of story. That's it. And so we are to assume that Rome's history has begun right at that point, and, uh, and the rest is history as the Romans know it.